the chapter here at uh, at Yuma. It's a grand privilege to have this invitation to come back again. We had a wonderful time the last time here, and then when I understood us to be back again, it made me feel real good to hear the testimonies and these fine words from the people and kind of boost you up a little. Uh, Billy told me that the brother from Las Vegas that uh, wanted a meeting there at the chapter seemed immediately after services over here. We have a time, he says, that we can slip in right over in January before the Phoenix meeting, see, to come to, to Las Vegas. And uh, so we've always wanted to get there. I believe Brother Art Wilson used to be there a long time ago, or he may still be there. And he, he asked me to come up. He and Sister Wilson, I didn't get the opportunity, so maybe this will be the time that I could come. You see, uh, Billy Paul, our Brother Roy Borders, I think he's here somewhere. Somebody said Brother Roy was in. Brother Perry, Lee, or any of them, they'll be able to tell you. And just set the dates for us to come. Now, I've seen many ministers here a while ago, to which I'm very happy to meet my brother and wish I had time to go home with you because I know you got the best cook there is in the country. <laughs> That's uh, uh, fine. And I, Brother Perry really got two tonight on him. He's got two marks against him now. One of them cutting that microphone in out there. When... <laughs> you're, you're held guilty of that, Brother Perry. I don't think you really were guilty, but you, uh, somebody's fixing to speak. That was a good one. And um, so then... Again, he went out there and was talking. He said, say, telling Brother Collins or some of them, that the supper was good, but said, I'm telling you, said, that man must be a Spaniard or something or a Mexican. That's the hottest pepper I ever taste. Going on like that, he's talking to the chef. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm the chef. <laughs> That's Texas for you. <laughs> We get him straightened out over here in Arizona after a while, won't we? Be staring us <laughs> Really nice to be here. And I guess those don't sound like jokes, but sense of humor, which the Lord itself had a sense of humor. You know, He said, "Harry, go tell that fox." <laughs> Today I cast out, <laughs> cast out devil some more and made perfect. So um, he was, had a sense of humor. Well, it won't hurt us, I don't think, once in a while. And now it's, it's a little late. And usually I, I preach about four hours. So this uh, knowing with courtesy to brother and sister here the chapter, we'll cut that way down tonight. And uh, uh, just I told Terry, I said, he said, what's, they put on a two-hour tape. I said, no, Terry, this is a, a banquet. I said, just about 30, 40 minutes. Uh, speak to the people. and uh, Something that I'd try always, each time, knowing that uh, when I was a little boy, uh, people used to come out to listen because I was a boy preacher, just a young fella, a chap. And they'd say, well, Billy Branham, you know, just a kid never know, went through school, and no education. They'd come out to hear my broken words, my Kentucky English, and, and uh, so they, my hits and haints and totes and carry. Like one of the meetings here not long ago, they said, we'll all stand up and sing the national anthem. I got and said, for my old Kentucky home, far away. <laughs> That's the only nation I know about, says so national anthem as far as I was concerned. So uh, now, actually, you got older, old, while we, you come in, you got to have something more than that. See, we're take. Paul said it when I was a child, I speak as a child, and thought as a child, you act as a child, but as you grow older, then you begin to, from making your first couple of steps and toddle and fall and get up and try it again. Then after a while you get so you can walk a straight line. And that's what we have to do as soldiers of the cross now. It's time to walk a straight line right down that highway to glory. I do believe that we are living in the closing scenes of the history of this world. I truly believe that the coming of the Lord is closer perhaps than we think. So now for just about 30 minutes of your time or something, I would like to call your attention to a scripture that I'd like to use for a text and, uh, and refer to some more here. I'm uh, sitting at home the other day. I was thinking on this thought, and then I thought, well, I don't know. Speaking from all this scripture, I just take part of it and just for these little short services like we would have tonight. I want to say one thing while you're turning over to Psalms, the um, the first, uh, the 27th Psalm, 
I want the first five verses uh, to read. would like to say this concerning this businessman's, a full gospel businessman's chapters. Uh, my brother Perry was speaking about the books and so forth and the new books that they got. How many remembers when we, I had the tape and we preached it over here at Phoenix at one of the conventions, uh, Sirs, what time is it? Now that was the beginning of that book, you see, when these, this takes place. There's too much supernatural a vindication of God's written word of this hour or something not to be approaching us now. Amen. We're just, it's too real. The things that you, it would be uh, astounding to you just to let you know that uh, what is really taking place. Many of you strangers perhaps hear these men get up and they make these remarks about a message of this hour and so forth. What they are getting at is God's promise of this hour that he promised what he would do, and we seem scripturally vindicating Amen. just exactly what he said he would do Amen. in the same manner. Foretold, it's just exactly perfectly each time because it's God saying it. Amen. If a man, I don't care who he was, would try to make such a prediction, there's one chance out of 10 million if a man told you a certain thing would happen, it would, it would happen at a certain time. One out of 10 million and then the place it would happen would be about one chance out of about a hundred million. And then the time it would happen goes on and on. And the way it will happen and what it will be happening and so forth, it's just beyond a guess when we see it so perfectly each and every time. Then it's God. It, then we turn right back in the Scriptures. It may seem foreign to us. But we turn right back in the Scriptures without even knowing where to look. And the Holy Spirit brings out this puts the whole word together, makes a picture there to show us just the hour that we're living in. We're changing dispensations. We're, cha we're at a corner. It's easy when somebody turns a corner uh, of a brick mason, uh, turns a uh, corner, starts everybody laying the bricks right down the same uh, roll like a certain denomination starts and starts rolling down the road. It's all right. But when you get to them turns, where you have to turn back the other way. Now, God isn't building a wall. He's building a house, <laughs> see? And there's many cuts and turns that he's predicted here in the Bible. And it, the turns, anybody could try to make a turn, but it must be according to the blueprint. Amen. If it isn't, it's got to be torn down again. Amen. So we, we praise God for his goodness and the fellowship of you people and the open doors that the Lord has given us. And through this businessman, I've always contended that uh, I didn't believe in... I believe in the people in denominations, but I don't have much uh, time to uh, exhort denominations because each one builds a fence around himself. And, and it's just like, a, I believe it was Brother David's uh, little thing by his raising some ducks and said the river come up and each duck, you know, they wanted fellowship with one another and they couldn't do it because it was all fenced up. But when the water got so high, he just floated the ducks out of the pen. So I think that's the way to do it. It's just the water's coming up. See? And uh, we can get out of the pen and, and fellowship with one another. You know, have the real love of Christ in our hearts. And this full gospel businessman has been a, an oasis for me. Because many times I have brothers, fine brothers, and I guess every denomination I've ever met. Presbyterians, Lutheran, Baptists. Pentecostals, all different types of the Pentecostals, Church of God and Nazarenes, Pilgrim Holiness, fine brethren everywhere. But many times they cannot have me in their community because, see, not if they don't believe it, but see, it would cut them off from the denomination. And when you do that, of course, that, that does it. Here not long ago, there's a Methodist brother came to me. I won't call his name, but a fine man. He's writing a thesis on divine healing, and he come to me for some, some talk. We sat down and talked a little while, and he said, the only thing we got against you, you're hanging around them Pentecostals all the time. I said, then let the Methodist church sponsor it. I'll come. <laughs> that was different, see. <laughs> he said, well, of course, I, I'm not the Methodist church. I just belong with them. I said, that's it, see. They're the ones, the Pentecostals is the ones that open their doors, see. That's the ones I can get to. And as many as them that will open, well, we're ready to come in. Like in the Revelations, the third chapter, he said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I'll come in. And, so, and that was Jesus. I always knows that was Christ. And he is the Word. That's right. He is the Word. And so the full gospel businessman has been an oasis 
where we could come together. No churches are sponsoring it. They're all together, the man out of the churches. And we come together in fellowship across the world, around everywhere. And I've helped establish many, many, many chapters throughout the entire world of the full gospel businessman. I'm thankful for that uh, opportunity that was given me. In there, the businessman will sponsor it, and then all the churches, they, they want to come anyhow. But then if I don't want to never try to pull somebody from their church... Just stay right in your church and scatter out the line. See, be a real Christian. Your pastor will appreciate you. A real, loyal, genuine saint. Any man that believes in God will appreciate a person like that. Yes. Now, um, I thank the brother here and his wife in this chapter for this opportunity. And may this chapter grow. May the blessings of God rest upon it and be an instrument in God's hands to save hundreds and hundreds of people before the coming of the Lord. And all the rest of you chapters are representatives here from the chapters. In the book of Psalms, now I want to speak on a, a real strange subject tonight, just for a little while. I've got some scriptures written down here, and, and I thought maybe that tonight I was going to speak on something different, but see the time get away. Well, I, I didn't want to stay that long, so I just turned over here and got some more scripture. And uh, I want to speak on the subject of the rapture. See? Now, we believe that there will be a rapture. All Christians believe that. That's Bible readers, believes that there will be a rapture. And now to read for uh, some background, we read the 25th uh, Psalm, uh, I mean, I beg your pardon, the 27th Psalm, one to five verses. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumble and fell. Though the host should encamp about me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to require in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in the pavilion and in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up on a rock. May the Lord add his blessings to that reading of his word. Now, today, speaking on this subject, and now some of you may differ, the, the avenues that I take, but how many here believe that the Bible teaches there will be a rapture of the Amen. church? Yes, sir, that's right. A catching away of the church. Whether you're uh, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, or whoever you are, Pentecostal, there will be a catching away. And I uh, think that in speaking, I, I just don't try to get up here to say something that I think would please the people. I've never been guilty of that. I want to get up here and say something as I feel led to say it that I think would be a help to you. Something that would further your experience with God if you are a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, make you so ashamed of yourself that you will become a Christian. And that's the purpose that I've always tried to uh, line up my thoughts as the Lord would lead me. Now, we are warned that then the doctrine of this in the last days will be scorned at. If you would, let's just read that just a minute. It's in um, uh, 2 Peter, the third chapter. Let's read just a moment on this. The third chapter and the third and fourth verses. Let's see if this isn't right. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that, that by the word of God the heavens were old and the earth standing out of the water and the wa and in the water, whereby the worlds that was being overflowed with water perished. 
Now, we see that the reason that this subject is so lightened that is because that the prophet here has said that in this last days these scoffers would come saying these things. It's predicted. The reason that people are acting today the way they're acting, why you certainly are expecting it, because the Bible said that in the last days they'd be heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent despisers of those that are good, having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof from such turn away. Can we look for an impersonation of truth? Certainly, when Moses went down into Egypt uh, to deliver the children of Israel with only a stick in his hand for vindication, with the God of heaven behind him, he performed a miracle. There are come impersonators behind him and fo- doing the same thing he did. Amen. See? Now, they come second after he did it first, then they come around because they were hopping after what he did, impersonating the original. Amen. We find that. And now you say, well, that was in the days of Moses, but the same scripture says that they'll come again in the last days. A Jamerson, and Jamis withstood Moses. So will these men of reprobate mind concerning truth. Amen. See? Impersonations. All kinds of things to upset people. And then, if this rapture which is coming to pass and anything that God has in the line of His Word, there's always something to come out to upset that if they can. It's, it's, it's Satan's purpose to do that. As the brother here from the meeting up there in Las Vegas said, Satan said the world was his dominion and... and that being his headquarters, I know that Satan is the God of this world. Every nation under heaven is controlled by him. Exactly, this world belongs to Satan. But Jesus will take it over. He offered it to him one day, and he refused it. But he said, because he knew he'd be heir to it in the times to come. Scoffers, let's just take for a few moments on that one word before we go further. Scoffers. I was reading a paper about two weeks ago in Tucson. There were some Englishmen from England had uh, made a statement, it's in headlines in a paper, that the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ was only faked between Pilate and Jesus, that he come to make a, just uh, make himself something. And there's no way that we could disprove that to him because all the things of God is to be received by faith. We must believe it. Now, he went ahead to give a description how that that could be done. Here not long ago in that great nation, London and England, rather, where that John Wesley and Charles and many of those great uh, preachers of the early days, Spurgeon and them, had preached the gospel in the hay markets and everywhere there. They turned down that message of their day and look what they are in this day. Amen. That's where Brother Williams and them are tonight. It's one of the lowest degraded countries in the world. I've been over the world. But I don't know anything is so illegitimate as, as England. It's, uh, Billy Graham said the same thing. He had to take his wife from the parks. How the, the, uh, the acts of between men and women were going on publicly in the parks. When I was there, I never seen anything that would break a person's heart anymore in what was going on in England, which had the opportunity and one time led the world in a reformation. Amen. It shows how it can fall. But you see what does that? The message that went forth then, the Englishmen try to hold that same message for today. That won't work today. Amen. Right. It won't work. How would, what if Moses would have come and brought Noah's message? We'll build an ark and float down the Nile. It wouldn't have worked. Amen. And neither would Jesus' message ever work of Moses. And neither will Wesley's message ever work in Luther or Luther's West message, vice versa. And today, we're, our last great reformation was Pentecost. And today, we're moving from that. Amen. And a Pentecostal message won't mix with this because it's another day. Amen. It's all the Word of God, but it's building like the feet, arms coming up. It's forming a bride for the rapture. So you don't, don't displace them people back there. They live to their message. All them will come out that was in the bride. It's like life going through a stalk of wheat. It leaves the wheat. The hull, but the wheat forms itself like the grain of wheat that fell in the ground. Here, not long ago, I was reading a book some German wrote in criticism. He said, of all of the, of the fanatics in the world, William Branham tops them all. He said, why, he's nothing but a, he's a, he's a magician. 
He tells these things. See, the man not knowing. And then the man was a critic. He didn't even believe in God. He said a God that could set up in the dark ages, hold his hands across his tummy, and laugh at a bunch of Christians being mothers, and his own disciples are supposed to be mothers with little children and things, and let lions eat them up and never even turn a hand. You see where the carnal mind, where education and things can't catch the vision? That carnal wheat had to fall into the ground. Just like Jesus had to fall to rise again, so did the church of Pentecost had to fall. It had to go into the ground. Them dark ages, any wheat, any uh, grain that goes into the ground, it has to lay in that dark time to bring forth, but it started sprouting in Martin Luther. Come on through Wesley, on out into Pentecost, now into the go out to the grain. And now the denominational systems that they left behind, their stocks. That's always to be burnt, the denominational system. But the real grain of wheat that come out of each one of those reformations will be caught up in the bride. It all together will make the bride. Now we find out in England there, they impersonated the crucifixion not long ago. A bunch of those people, them long, kids with them long hair and things, and hollering, call Jesus daddy-o and all that stuff. That's scum. Now you said that's in London, England. Watch what was in the paper last week here in America. Some great doctor of divinity from a fine school said that the, the crucifixion was a fake. Said that Jesus only tried to make himself like that. That he had drank in this mandrake weed. And we find it in Genesis where it spoke of. It's a weed like marijuana or something found in the orange there. And if you drink it, it'll put you to sleep. Maybe in your, like your dead slump, everything, for two or three days at a time. He said when they give him vinegar and gall, it's all possible that that was mandrake weed. And when they did, they give him that, and he went a slump like he was dead. They put him in the tomb. And the lady married after two or three days, sure, going back, then he's awake again. was all right. Said he went up to India and died somewhere. An ordinary death. Trying to fake a religion. The first place, that critic. What's the matter with people? See, it's just this day we're living in scoffers. See, the day to fulfill the prophecy. God lauded his word out to each age. And each one of those ages has to manifest that. And he also foreordained man for that age to fulfill that word. Amen. Every time he lauded his word, he lauded the man for it. When he lauded Moses' time, he lauded Moses to it. When he lauded the time for the Son of God to be born, he lauded him to it. Every age, he's lauded his man. Foreordained, as the Bible said, nothing. Is, if God's infinite, almighty, all-powerful, omnipresent, omnipotent, why, he knowed all things from the beginning. So he knows there's nothing out of cater. It's just us that thinks it is. Does everything run? Look back at his word and see what he's doing. Then we'll have an understanding. Now just think. The first place, if that minister would have thought when they put that vinegar and gall in his mouth, he spit it out. He did not take it at the first place. Amen. See? Just scoffers rising. Another thing. How did this Jesus of Nazareth, how did his life fit every prophecy of the Old Testament? How could it have been? It couldn't have been without it being ordained of God. His life fit every prophecy of the Old Testament. Another thing, if those disciples had faked him like that, why did each one of them die and martyr him? And even the Apostle Peter said, turn my head upside down, I'm not worthy to die like him. How they took Andrew and turned him sideways on the cross. They everyone sealed their testimony in their own blood. They believed him and loved him and gave their lives for him. If he was a faker... How would they ever have done that? See, the spiritual application, the people don't get it. There was a great man here not long ago, some great rabbi that wrote that Moses, Paul, passing through the Red Sea, said it wasn't actually water. The water's never walled up. Said what it was up at the other end of the Dead Sea, there was a bunch of reeds, and he passed through the water reeds, the reeds of the water. No water in there, just a bunch of reeds, an ocean of of reeds they pass through. And many clergymen believe it. They accept it. Here not long ago when this uh, first uh, astronaut went up, he come back and he hadn't seen nothing of God. That even turned ministers around. They thought God lived right up there somewhere uh, 150 miles high. Why, my, how... Education and wisdom of this world has turned the church into a bunch of ragweeds. Uh, it's... Education and the educational system, science and civilization is of the devil. It's the devil's civilization. The Bible said so. And our civilization is coming on. will have nothing to do with this civilization at all. It's nothing of it at all. It'll be a different civilization. 
into this civilization, this scientific world we got, more science, scientific we get, further we go into death, things, traps to kill and everything. In that new civilization, there'll be no death, no sickness, sorrow, or no pain. See? There won't be none in there. So this civilization will have to be destroyed because it's of the devil. We find out that in Genesis 4, that Cain's people started civilization, building towns and cities and so forth, and instruments of music and become in science. And the people got further away from God, yet religious. But when Seth's people come on, they begin to come on, call on the name of the Lord. I talk about a silly one. I'm not here to hurt anybody's feelings, say something about a church. And if you're here and belong to this church, I'm not saying this hurts your feelings, because just as many good people in there as there is uh, in other churches. But I was reading this report last week where the Catholic Church made a statement. And we see where they're all coming together now at the Great Ecumenical Council and so forth. Just exactly fulfilling what the Bible said they'd do. Just exactly. Now, we find out they said, well, the Bible, uh, some of the Protestants want to hold to that Bible. What well, said the Bible was nothing but a book, a history of the church, and they didn't have it in literature until about 250 years ago. It's always been the church. That it was a church, not a Bible, and the Bible is just a history of what the church did. What a subtle lie that is. Amen. Well, we've had a Bible for 3,000 years. The Old Testament has been written in Scripture for hundreds and hundreds of years before the coming of Christ. It's just a subtle thing of the devil. And we find out in this day when this great scoffing and making fun of the Bible and trying to push it out, God's got to judge the church by something. He can't be just. They can't go down the street and arrest me and say, I'm making uh, 30 miles an hour in a 20-mile zone unless there's something there to tell me that I'm only allowed to go 20 miles. It has to be there. And God's going to judge the church, is going to judge the people someday. We know that there's a judgment coming. So if he's going to judge it by the Catholic church, which Catholic church? Amen. If he's going to judge it by the Methodists, the Baptists is lost. If he judge it by the oneness, the twoness is lost. Amen. See? What's he going to judge it by? He said he would judge it by Christ. Amen. And Christ is the Word. Amen. So it's the Word of God that God will judge. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. See? So he'll judge it by his Word. And now we find out that in this day when they're trying to push the Bible out, except the church, the Bible... Don't want it, the church, so they can just make any kind of a creed or anything else and walk by it. Well, as I was speaking the other night at Shreveport, in the, the communion, when they just killed that sacrificial lamb, there was to be no leaven among them through the entire seven days. There no leaven, no leaven bed. Everything had to be unleavened. That represented the seven church ages that we get in the book here. And there's no leaven. What is something mixed with it. And we're mixed creed and denomination and everything else with the Word and still trying to call it the Word. No leaven shall be the entire seven days. And even what is eat today, don't try to keep it for tomorrow. Burn it with fire before daylight come. For there's a new message coming for it and a new thing. See, try to hold it over. But that's been the attitude of the church. A revival goes forth. And the first thing you know, within about three years, they start an organization over it. The denomination starts an organization. But have you noticed... This has been sweeping for 20 years now, and there's no organization. And there never will be. This is the end. The wheat's come back to the wheat again. The wheat's come back to its grain. The shuck is pulled away from it. And the wheat must lay in the presence of the sun to be ripened. Isn't it a strange thing that not long ago on the East Coast, the big blackout, they couldn't understand it. Texas blacked out last week. They can't understand it. Don't you realize that that's a sign? Don't you know the nations are breaking? Israel's in her homeland, and these signs are indicating that we are at the end. Amen. At the same time it's blacking out, don't you know that's a sign that the prophet said, that but there shall be light about the evening time, Amen. that there will be a light come forth in the evening time, Amen. when the blackouts and things are going the way they are now. Look at just how it blacked out. The Pope just come over here. Remember if the tabernacle, when them, you've got tapes, I guess all of you take them, how the... The Lord showed there that day in the tabernacle exactly where those church ages would be and how they would be. And I had them drawn out on the board up there, them church ages, which you see here, drawn out in the book. And if that 
Holy Spirit didn't come down in a big pillar of fire and went right back on that wall and drawed them out himself while three or four hundred people sitting looking at it. And just the, the Pope start over here, the moon somehow blacked out and they took the pictures the same way that it was drawn up there on the platform. Now he's made his trip over here on the 13th, walked 13 steps, served communion of 13 to a nation's number 13, and blackouts coming everywhere. Amen. Don't you see where we're at? We're at the end time. Amen. Scoffers shall rise in the last days. Say there's no difference in the time than what it was, and what our fathers fell asleep. But when you see these things begin to happen, raise up your head. Get ready. Something could happen at any time. Christ come for his church. Now, they don't believe it because it is, uh, it's, uh, they, they're spo- they don't realize that they're the ones fulfilling the Scriptures. The people really don't realize that doing these things and saying these things, they're fulfilling the Scriptures. How little did Caiaphas is a high priest and all those de- priests in that day that scoffed and made fun of him didn't know that the very God that they were singing about, my God, why has thou forsaken me? The 22nd Psalm. My hands and my feet they pierced singing that in the temple and Him dying out there on the cross. Amen. Little did they know they were doing it. Even Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Because they were actually predicted by the Scriptures to be blind. Amen. Did you know the Protestant and Catholic Church is predicted in the last days to be blind? Right. The same thing to the Scriptures with Christ on the outside trying to get in? Amen. Because thou sayest, I am rich and in need of nothing, knowest thou not that thou art miserable, poor, wretched, naked, and blind, and don't know it. Amen. Revelation 3. There you are, back to the blindness again, trampling over the things of God as if they, it didn't mean nothing to them, scoffing and making fun of it. That's what the Bible said. But to the church, the bride, the rapture is a revelation to her. Amen. It's revealed to her. That's a revelation, a true bride of Christ will be waiting for that revelation of the rapture. Now, it is a revelation, for the revelation is faith. You cannot have a revelation without it being faith. Faith is a revelation because it's something that's revealed to you. Faith is a revelation. Faith is something that has been revealed to you, like it was to Abraham that could call anything contrary to what had been revealed to him as though it wasn't so. Now, faith, that's what faith is, is the revelation of God. The church is built upon a revelation. The whole entire body. Here a few weeks ago, I was talking to a fine Baptist minister. He come up to discuss with me. He said, I like you as a man, but said, you're all mixed up. I said, and I pray you help me get straightened down. He said, with the scripture. He said, uh, we'll never be able, Brother Branham, to get the things together till we get every word upon word upon word exactly with the Greek and so forth. I said, oh, sir, you know better than that. I said, even in the Nicaea Council, way back as far as that, 300 years from the death of Christ, they were still debating which Greek scholar was right. You can know. It's a revelation. The whole thing is, he said, I cannot accept revelation. I said, then how can you accept Christ? He said, well, the Bible said, he that believeth is uh, on Jesus Christ has everlasting life. I said, that is true. It also says that no man can call Jesus the Christ only by the revelation of the Holy Ghost that's revealed it to him. Amen. There you are, right back around again. Paul's right back to the revelation. It's got to be revealed. In the Bible, Cain and Abel didn't have a Bible t- to read, but it was revealed to Abel by faith, which is a revelation. Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than that of Cain, which God testified that he was righteous. When Jesus was asked here in Matthew 16, 17, and 18, we haven't time to read it, but if you want to write it down, he said, Who does man say I, the Son of Man, am? One of them said, You're Moses or Elias or something. He said, But who do you say I am? He said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonas, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. My Father which is in heaven has revealed this to you. Upon this rock. Amen. The spiritual revelation of who God is, who Jesus is. Amen. And He is the revelation of God, God made in flesh and revealed to the world. Amen. He was in the world. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, revealing what God was in a body of flesh. Thou art the Christ, the anointed one, the Son of God. He said, flesh and blood never revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed this to you upon this rock. Amen. I'll build my church. The revelation of the Word in its season. 
I'll build my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. The book of the Revelations is the last book of the Bible. It's sealed to unbelievers. In there, the Bible says in the 22nd chapter, whosoever shall take one word from it or add one word to it, I'll take his part from the book of life. We realize that then it was altogether given for believers. And it opens the book of Revelations and reveals who the author of this entire book is. He used to look up on it, Alpha and Omega, from Genesis to Revelations, Jesus Christ, just the same, right straight through. And reveals his complete mystery of himself and his plans for his church ages that's to come and was sealed in there by seven seals. Now, the book was written, but then, remember, it was sealed with seven seals, and these seven seals was not to be opened, Revelations 10, until the sounding of the last earthly angel on earth, Revelations 10, 7. And as the days of the sounding of the last angel's message, seventh angel, the mystery of God should be finished in that age. And that's the age that we're living in. We all know we're living in the Laodicea age. There will never be another age to it. It can't be. So we're living in the Laodicea age, and these seven seals that's helped that book as a mystery to people should be open at that day. That's what he promised. Now, it won't be nothing outside the Word because you can't add to the Word or take from the Word. It's got to remain always the Word, but the revelation is to reveal the truth of it, what it is to make it fit with the rest of Scripture, and then God vindicates that to be the truth. See, God don't need no interpreter. He's His own interpreter. He does His own interpretation by bringing to pass the things that He said would happen. Like in the beginning, He said, Let there be light. And there was light. I don't need any interpretation. It was vindicated. Now, He promised certain things in this last day in the Scripture. Well, there it was. That's how Jesus was the Son of God. He promised to send Him. When He was in His days here on earth and the people couldn't believe Him, He said, Search the Scripture. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. If I do not the works of my Father, then believe me not. But if you can't believe me, believe the works that I do, because they testify who I am. Well, then, in Wesley's age, the works that he did testified who he was. In Luther's age, on the Reformation, well, sure, it testified who he was. In the days of the Pentecostals, the restoring back of the gifts, the restoration of the gifts, speaking in tongues and casting out devils and the gifts, why, well, I testified. There was no joke about it. People said, when they first raised up, I read the books on the history of Pentecost. They said, it can't last long. It'll burn down. It's still burning. Amen. Why? It's because you'll never put it out. God said it would be there. Amen. It's that portion of the Word. And no more could you put that out. And then when the bride is being called out, how are you going to put it out? It's a revelation of the manifestation of the Word made true. And we're living in that day. Praise be to God. The revelation of the mystery of Himself. Now, the rapture is only, this rapture that we're talking about is only for the bride. Remember the Bible said, And the rest of the dead live not for a thousand years. This great rapture. If there's not a rapture, friends, where are we at? What are we going to do? What age are we living in? What promise do we have? Amen. There is going to be a rapture. Amen. The Bible says there will be, and it will be only for the elected, Amen. the elected lady, the bride, in this day that's pulled out. The church, the very word church means called out of. As Moses called a nation out of a nation, the Holy Spirit is calling a bride out of a church, a church out of a church. Amen. Members from every denomination making up a bride. Amen. Bride tree, it's in the, in the tape. The bride tree. A bride coming out call, and that's the one that the bride tree is, the, the bride rather, is the one that's going to be in the rapture. That alone. Amen. Nothing but the bride. The elected ones, foreknown by God. From the beginning, the Father's spiritual chains. Let me just stop here a minute. If I keep getting nervous thinking I'm going, to hold, I'm going to hold you too long. But notice, look, each one of you people, do you know 
years before you were born, you were in your father as a gene? That's right. A germ of seed. What's in your father comes from the male sex, not the female. Female furnishes an egg, a bedding ground. But the germ come from the father. Now, say, in my father, or my son sitting here, when I was 16 years old, my son was in me. I didn't know him, but he was there. Now, through a bedding ground, through holy wedlock, he becomes in the image of me. I know him. I can fellowship with him. And he comes just at the time when it's the right time. Now, so were you in, if you've got eternal life, you were a in God before there ever was a world. You are a part, a son of God, an attribute of God. He knew the very age you were coming. He predestinated you to that age to take that place and no one else can take it. Amen. Care how many impersonations and things you've got to be there because he knew you'd be there. Now, you are made manifest. Now, you can fellowship with him and that's what he wants. He's longing for fellowship. To be worshipped. But if your life did not be, always was as an attribute in God, you're just a mimic of Christianity. The, there'll be millions and billions of them. They'll just be mimics of Christianity. A remark that I made just recently. I was watching Brother Demas Shakarian over there when he was having high breeding cattle. Watch the test tubes and so forth. Being taken in by doctors and watching these things. In the literal discharge of the male, there's somewhat a million germs comes forth from the male at each a time. And somewhat a million eggs comes from the female at the same time. But did you know in all them little germs moving around, a million of them, there's only one of them ordained to life? And there's only one egg fertile? And that little germ will crawl right through every one of them other little germs, right over the top of every little germ looking just like him, and come over the top of that and come over here and find that fertile egg and crawl into it, and then all the rest of them die? Well, I talk about the virgin birth, which well, not half his mystery, it's a, it's a physical birth. How it's foreordained, predestinated by God. Now, in the beginning, way back, way years ago, before there was a time began, you, if you are a born-again Christian tonight, you were in God then, your Father. Amen. That's why when you come into this life here and profess Christianity, you want everything going wrong, you wonder why this isn't all this, it, you wondered at it. But one day something struck you. What was it? That life that was down in there from the beginning. And it, 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 a little story about the eagle, finding it, his mother finding the eagle. You've heard me preach on that. How that little eagle was hatched under a hen. But she, her habits of trying to feed them, them chickens, the little eagle couldn't stomach it because he wasn't a chicken to begin with. Amen. Yet he was in the pen with the chickens and followed the chickens. But she was scratching the barnyard and things and the little eagle couldn't stand it. But every time she would cluck and everything, all the little chickens go, so he'd go too. But one day his mother knew that she had laid two eggs, not one. There had to be another one somewhere. She went to hunt it, flying around, circling. Finally, she came over to the barnyard, and she found her baby, and she screamed to him. It was a voice that he realized that that's the thing that fit. That was what he's looking for. See? And he realized then that he wasn't a chicken. He was an eagle. And that's the way it ever born again Christian. When you come, I don't care how many denominations you join, how many names you put your name on the books and things. When that real word of God is vindicated and made true before you like that, you realize you're an eagle right there. Because all this plucking of the hen, you join this and join this and go this way and that way. It's nonsense. It's a genuine adding word to word. When a germ comes into the womb of, a, of the female... It don't take on you. You didn't become a human germ from your father, and then the next thing you become a germ from a dog, and the next thing from a cat, and the next thing from a chicken. It's all human germ. And the body of Jesus Christ, the bride will be part of his body, which will he was the word, and the bride will have to be the word. Amen. Word added to word, add to word. Luther's justification, Wesley's sanctification, Pentecostal's baptism with the Holy Spirit, restoration of the gifts, and all the rest of it goes with it. It's got to be word on top of word. Amen. Germ on top of germ. Life on top of life. 
to bring out the full statue of the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you remember you was an attribute. And now the thing of it is, after we find out these things, that Christ is coming for His bride, now how do we get into that bride? That's the question. Many say, join our congregation. One of them wants a certain type of baptism. One wants to do this or that. One said you must speak with tongues or you haven't got it. The other said you don't have to speak with tongues. This one says you must dance in the Spirit. This one says you must shout. This has got a sense chasing. It's all all right, and then still it's all wrong. How could a man that's, or a woman or a child of God that's born of the Spirit of God deny the Word of God? When God Himself interpreted it and said, This is it. I promised it. Here it is. Showing it just as plain as they can. Why, they're bound to see it. See? How could Christ deny His own Word? If Christ is in you, it can't deny His own Word. Then how do we get into this body? First Corinthians 12. By one Spirit, we're all baptized into this body. By one Holy Spirit baptism. Now, if you want to put that down, that's First Corinthians 12, 13. And by one Spirit, we are all baptized, and the Spirit is the life of Christ. Amen. Is that right? Amen. The life of Christ and the life of any seed which He was. The Word seed brings the seed to life. Amen. You get it? If that, if that life is laying in the seed, and this baptism of the Holy Spirit comes upon it, it's bound to bring that seed life. Amen. As I told you here Phoenix not long ago, I was talking to Brother John Sheriff. And I was out there and he showed me a tree, a citrus. He's, he raised a lot of citrus fruit. And he showed me one tree that had eight or nine different kinds of fruit on it. And I said, Brother Sheriff, what kind of tree is that? It's an orange tree. I said, why is the lemon and the tangerine and tangelo and grapefruit? He said, it's all citrus fruit. They're grafted. Oh, I said, I see now next year it'll all have oranges. But Oh, no. Each tree will bear its own. Each lamb will bear its own fruit. Many of you fruit growers know that you're in, in this citrus valley. It'll bear its own. You put a lemon a branch in an orange tree, it'll bear lemons. Because it's the nature of a citrus fruit, yet it won't bear the original fruit. And that's what we've done. We've grafted in, taken in with creeds and so forth, and grafted in each year. How can a Methodist bring forth anything but a Methodist child? How can any denomination bring forth anything but a denominational child? But if that tree ever puts out an original branch, it'll bring forth oranges. And then if God ever does anything in the church, it'll be original back with the Word again. Exactly. It has to be. Because the life is in the tree and it bears its own kind. Now, when we find out now there's that big church that's moved down through the ages, bearing its fruit. And as the limbs quit, they prune them off. And St. John 15, never prune the vine out. Now, I took the branches off. Cut them out because it wasn't bearing any fruit. And and we, Jesus wants fruit of it for Himself. His wife must bring forth the kind of a children that He is. Then if she don't bring forth children, bride children, word children, then it's the denominational child. Then her first love for the world and denomination, she's gone back to that. And it can't bring forth a real, genuine, born-again Christian because there's nothing there to bring it forth. It's like if you take a lemon branch and stick it in there, it'll bring a lemon. But it can't bring a orange because it wasn't there at the beginning. But it was ordained at the beginning, foreknowledge of God, predestinated and born. It has to bring forth an orange. It can't bring nothing else. That's the way at the church of the living God. When the hour comes, everybody, you let God start to do something, everybody's got the ball and gone. See? It's always been that way. I was reading a history of Martin Luther. You're not long ago said, the it wasn't so hard to believe that Martin Luther could protest the Catholic Church and get by with it. But said so the strange thing is he could hold his head above all the fanaticism that followed his revival and still stay straight on his justification. It is everything, impersonations and everything falling. Look at Mrs. Simple McPherson, Amy Simple McPherson. They had this temple over here. Every lady preacher had them wings and packed the Bible the same way. Just, uh, just carnal impersonations. They can't be original. Amen. That's the way the churches can't be. You let one church get something other in the city, the other church can't stand it, they get it. See? They're not original anymore. God's Word is original. It's the Word, and it has to bring forth 
It's, ty- it's kind in its season. Elected, predestinated by the Father God. Now, how do we get into this church? By one spirit, we are all baptized into this one body. Body of Christ, which is the bride, the Word. Baptized in there by the Holy Spirit. Now, let's notice whether we're in the last age or not. Now we find out, if we turn back in Genesis, about the, uh, all about the fifth chapter, you can also turn to Luke and find out that Enoch was the seventh from Noah. Enoch, there catches a serpent seed for if Cain was Abel's son, then he was the eighth, you see. But nowhere in the Bible it said that Cain was Abel's son, or Cain, or Cain was uh, Adam's son, because uh, the Bible said he was of that evil one, and Adam wasn't the evil one. See? He was of the evil one. Now we find here that Enoch was the seventh from Noah, which was a type of the church ages. Now all of the rest of the six men before him died, but Enoch was translated. Enoch was raptured. Amen. The seventh showing that it's the seventh church age that takes the rapture. Amen. Now, there's no doubt we're in the seventh church age. That's right. We all know it. Now, it's the seventh church age that takes the rapture. Amen. All of the other six died. But Enoch was translated because he was not found. God took him. But Enoch raptured was a type of all of the rest of them dying, but the the end time bride will be called out of the, the rapture without death will be called out of the seventh church age, which we are now bearing record of that age. Oh, let's dig in now real deep. Now, here also a type of the seventh church ages, which in Revelations 10, 7, that the great mystery of the book was to be unfolded by the seventh angel's message. Now, there's a messenger above always and a messenger on earth. The English word angel means a messenger. And in the seventh angel's message, while he was making his proclaiming his ministry, then when he began to sound forth his ministry, not when he started out. Jesus, when he started out, he started healing the sick, afflicted, oh, that great rabbi, he's a prophet, and everybody wanted him in his church. But when he sat down one day and said, I and my father are one, Amen. that was different. Amen. That was different. And except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Well, he's a vampire. See, see, that was different. He didn't explain it. Amen. They'd already seen the manifestation, the vindication of the Word of God for his age made real and proved to him that he was that messenger of that age. And he didn't have to explain nothing. Those disciples might not have been able to explain it, but they believed it whether they could explain it or not. They sat right still and believed it. How could they tell this go to eat his flesh and drink his blood? It was impossible for him to do it. But they believed it because they were ordained. Jesus said he chose them before the foundation of the world. See? They believed it whether they could explain it or not. They still believed it. Now, watch. Now, in the seventh church age, when the seventh angel begins to sound, the mysteries of God was to be made known, right? there, The seals that the reformers had, been, had had time. Luther didn't live long enough. Neither did Wesley. The ages didn't live long enough. And reformers, they had their message of that day, and the people grasped it and denominated it. What is it? You can never beat nature. Nature always testifies God runs in continuity with nature. It has to, like the sun. The sun rises in the morning, it's a little baby born. It's weak, ain't got much heat to it. Ten o'clock, it's coming out of high school. Middle of the day, it's entering into life. Three o'clock in the afternoon, it's getting old. Five o'clock, it's dying. Old and weak again, going back to the grave. Is that the end of it? It rises again the next morning. See? Look at the trees, how they put forth their leaves. Everything that they do. Now we find out the leaves drop off the tree. Go back. What the life goes down to the root of the tree. Is that the end of it? It comes back next spring with a new life. Now watch the churches how it's done the same thing in the Reformation. It come up. That a corn of wheat fell in the ground and died under the dark age persecution. It went into the ground. It had to die. Any man spiritual can see that. that unless that seed uh, uh, dies and rots, it abides alone. And it had to go into the ground under the dark age. 
It lay there, rotted, and come forth in two little blades of the Lutheran church. Out of the Lutheran church, brought off more blades, swingly and so forth. From that, come on up into the tassel, which was John Wesley, the great missionary age. It dropped back. Out of there, come that deceiving age, that Pentecostal age, that corn of wheat. That Anybody ever here ever raised any wheat? You look at that wheat when you look at it. When you go out there and say, how about wheat? You look like you got a wheat there. Open it up real close and watch. You ain't got a wheat at all. You got a shuck. Didn't Jesus warn us that of Matthew 24, 22, 4, in the last days, that the two spirits would be so close together, it would deceive the elected wheat itself, if it was possible. See? Now watch. It's a carrier. Now the life that come up through Luther was what made Wesley. The life that come out of Wesley is what made Pentecost. The life that comes out of Pentecost makes a wheat. But they are a carrier, see? The real life goes through there. The message goes through. But it's heading on up into the wheat. That's the reason the wheat come up and brings the whole thing in the rapture up here at the top. The bride itself comes out of each age. But the denominational stalk dies. Right, amen. Dries up. And dies. Have you noticed this last days? How it's beginning to pull away now. When that wheat begins to grow, then the, the shuck begins to get away from it. Look back in that little wheat when you look at it. Pull it open like this and look into it. And see, you've got a little bud of wheat back there. You'd have to take a 30-power scope to look into it to see the little bud of wheat back there. See? But it's way back in there. But it starts growing. Now that shuck has to be there to shelter that, to give it a chance to get out. But then when it begins to grow and the message begins to spread, then the shuck pulls away from it. And the light goes right out of that shuck right into the wheat. It goes on. That's the way each age does. It just, it just can't beat nature. It's, that's God's continuity, the way He does things. And now, that's the age that we're living in. Right now, the seventh church age. Now, it's all to be manifested in the grain of wheat at the end. Another comeback. Now, if you take Luke, the 17th chapter, the 31st, He said, As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man, when the Son of Man begins to reveal Himself. What is revealed, make his revelation of what he is in this day revealed out to the people. Amen. The word that's made known for the day revealed to the people by the manifestation of the Holy Spirit making that Jesus live among us. Amen. And remember, he was represented there in a man. A man. He said, as it was. Now, he read the same Bible we read, Genesis. Amen. Now, we notice in that Genesis chapter there, when Jesus was speaking about it. We find there that in that, with his back turned to that tent, and Sarah in the tent, he said, he asked a question. And she didn't believe that what was going to happen could happen. He said, now, Abraham, I'm going to visit you according to the time of life. And Sarah in the tent laughed about it. He said, why did Sarah laugh in the tent? Then how can these things be? Jesus promised, and that was him, Abraham called him Elohim, the Almighty, that wasn't... Now, the Bible predicts that it will return again in the last days. Jesus said so. And when you see these things begin to come to pass, just remember, when this starts to take in place like that, then it should know that the time is not at the door. Look at the world itself. Look at the world. Sodom, if there ever was a Sodom. Look at the people perverted in such a perverting... Their minds are perverted. They don't know what common decency is. Look at the outlaws, sexuals, and everything else. Look at our women, what a rampage it's made. Amen. Look what a rampage of indecency and moral amongst our women. And not only are, you say, that's Methodist, that's Pentecostal. That's the whole thing. Look at our man. They hang instead of the Word of God, some little tradition of a denomination, they hang on to it. Amen. Instead of coming out when they see God make Himself known perfectly. Amen. The reason they're blind, they can't see it. They never will see it. Now watch what takes place here. And this, while we hurry, I think that lady wants us to leave. I've seen her uh, uh, motion her hand something other about she wants us to get out. So we better hurry. So now notice, Enoch, the type of the church. Here he's also typed in the seventh church age. Can you think of that? The seventh church age. Notice at the sounding of how many believe there have been seven messengers Amen. for the seventh church. Oh, we all believe it. If we believe the Bible, if we don't believe the Bible, of course, these, we don't believe it. But there has been, now we're living in the seventh church age. And when the Bible said that this seventh church age, when the messenger of the seventh church age begins to sound his message, that the mysteries of all things has been twisted up down through the age would be revealed in that time. Here we see it. 
the Son of Man, coming among His people and doing just exactly, confirming His message as He said He would do. Here we find it in this last age. Now, and the seven watches, like the seven watches, one come, He didn't come to first watch, second, third, fourth, but come in the seventh watch. That was Enoch, the seventh, which was translated, and Noah being a type of the remnant of the Jews is to be carried over. Now, in the Bible times, talking about the watches, and nights were not divided into hours in the Bible time. Now, listen closely, because I'll hurry now, because I want the room. No, the Bible was not divided, or uh, the night was not divided in hours in the Bible time. It was divided in watches. There were three watches. Now, the first watch started at, from 9 until 12. The second watch started from 12 to 3. And the third watch of the night was counted from 3 to 6. Now we got three, three threes, which is a nine in perfect number. Then we come back to the seven for the rapture, which will take place, I believe, between six and seven o'clock, or six and nine o'clock some morning. For the trumpet of the Lord shall sound on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise in the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their homes beyond the sky, when the rolls called up yonder, I'll be there. The word rapture in the Bible is not even used at all. We just put that word there. The Bible says caught up, Amen. being caught up. We read here in Second Thessalonians, or First Thessalonians, it is the uh, 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 order of this great rapture that will take place in the last days. Listen to this here. We're going to begin here with 13th verse. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others that have no hope. For if we believe Christ died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For we say this unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, that word prevent means to hinder, those that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend, now listen close, the Lord himself shall descend from the heavens with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, I want you to notice a great thing taking place here now. Don't miss this thing. Now, notice the word says here in 2 Thessalonians that there's three things. Notice from the 13th to the 16th verse, there's three things that has to happen before the Lord himself appears. Quickly now so we can close. The first thing happens, notice, a shout, a voice, a trumpet. Let's read it now and see if that's right, see? For the Lord himself, 16th verse, shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Three things happen, a voice, a shout, a voice, a trumpet. Has to happen before Jesus appears. Now, a shout. Jesus does all three of them when he's, 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 he's descending. A shout, what is a shout? It's the message. Amen. Going forth first, the living bread of life bringing forth the bride. Now, God has a way of doing things. And He never changes His policy. Right. He never changes His policy. He's an unchanging God. Amen. And Amos 3, 7, He said He would do nothing on the earth until first He revealed it to His servants, the prophets. Amen. And just as certain as He promised it, He'll do it. Now, we've come through the church ages, but we're promised in the last days, according to Malachi 4, that there would be a return again of prophet in the land. That's right. That's right. Notice his nature and what he would be like. He's always, uh, God uses that spirit five times. Once in Elijah, in Elisha, and John the Baptist, call out the church and the remnant of the Jews. Five times grace. J-E-S-U-S-F-A-I-T-H. And it's a number of grace. See? All right. Now remember, the message is promised, and when all these mysteries has been also bundled up by a bunch of Ecclesiastes, it will take a, a direct prophet from God to reveal it. And that's exactly what he promised to do. See? Now remember, the word of the Lord comes to the prophet, not the theologian, the prophet. Uh, he is a reflector of God's word. He can't say nothing. He can't say his own thoughts. He can only speak what God reveals. Even to the prophet Balaam, 
when he was trying to be a uh, soul seller's right, he said, how can any prophet say anything but what God puts in his mouth? It's a thing that God does that you can't say nothing else. Amen. And you're born that way no more than you could. If you could say, I, 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 I can't open my eyes when you're looking. See, you can. You can't reach your hand when you can. See, you can't be a dog when you're human. See, you're just made thus. And God has always, to in the ages, to Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the Elijah and the ages gone by, when the ecclesiastical group get everything all mixed up, he would send a prophet. Amen. Raise him up from nowhere. He'd belong to another situation and speak his word. Amen. Amen. Called off a scene and gone. This rugged man of the truth of God. And it's always the way you could tell him, he said, if there be one among you spiritual or prophet, now prophets, there's such a thing as gift of prophecy in a church, but a prophet is predestinated and foreordained for the hour. Amen. Yes, sir. Now, if a prophecy goes forth, two or three has to sit in church where that's right or not before the church can receive it. But nobody sat before a prophet. Because he was, he was absolutely the Word of God. He was that Word in his day. You see, God reflect. Now, God has promised to send us that again in the last days to bring that bride out of that ecclesiastical Amen. mess. Amen. And the only way it can be done. It'll never be done. The church can't receive Christ. We, the Pentecostals, we can't carry this message on in the condition the church is in today. How are we going to carry out the end time in the condition they're in today? When everyone against the other and everything else in ecclesiastically, oh, mercy. It's a mess. It's done gone into denominations and any time. I ask any historian to, to, to say different. Every time that a message went forth in the earth and when they organized it, it died right there. And Pentecost done the same thing as the old. The Pentecost that come out, you assemblies of God, when your forefathers and mothers come out of them organizations back there in the old general council, shouted and praised God and talked against those things and you turn like a dog to its vomit and a hog to its water and done the same thing that they did. And now so ecclesiastically you shut up your bowels of compassion. Amen. You have to have a fellowship card before you can even associate with your heart. You oneness? God giving you a message like that and instead of you going ahead and just keep it humble and going ahead, you had to turn loose and organize your group. Amen. Where are you all at? The same bucket. Right. That, and God's Spirit moving on. Amen. How the Lord of plant our water day and night lest some should... He ordained these things to be. And He must send this. The first thing comes when He starts to send it from the heaven. There's a shout. What is it? It's a message to get people together. A message comes forth first. Now, lamp trimming time. Rise and trim your lamps. What watch was that? The seven. Amen. Not the six, the seven. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Rise and trim your lamps. And they did. Some of them found they didn't even have any oil in their lamps. See? But it's lamp trimming time. It's Malachi 4 time. Amen. What he prom- it's Luke 17. It's, it's Isaiah, all those prophecies that it can perfectly set in order for this day in the Scripture. We see it living right there. Amen. There's no... See these things happen. My dear brother and sister, when God in heaven knows I could die on this platform right now, you, you just ought to walk around a while. Uh, it's just... It's tremendous. When you see God come from the heaven, stand before groups of men and stand there and declare Himself just as He ever did. Amen. And that's the truth in this Bible. Oh, we're here. And the denominational system is dead. It's gone. It'll never rise again. It'll be burned. That's what you do with the husk on the field. Flee from it. Get into Christ. Don't say, I belong to Methodist. I belong to Baptist. I belong to Pentecostal. You get into Christ. And if you're in Christ, there's not a word written in here, but what you believe, I don't care what anybody else says. And then God makes that thing manifest because you, when He pours the Spirit upon the Word, what happens is like putting water on any other seed. It'll live. And it'll bring forth of its kind. You say, I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That don't mean that you're saved. Not by a long ways. Look here. You are a triune being. You are inside this little fellow here is a soul. The next is the Spirit. And next is the body. Now, you've got five senses of this body to contact your earthly home. They don't contact the rest of it. You've got five senses of the Spirit here, love and conscience and so forth of that. But in here is where you live. Amen. That's what you are. Didn't Jesus say the rain falls on the just and the unjust? 
put a cockleburr out here and wheat out there and pour water on them and keep them under fertilized and things like that, won't they both live by the same water? Amen. Well, what is it? One of them will bear a cockleburr because that's all he is. Amen. The cockleburr will raise his hands and shout just the same as the wheat. Right. So the Bible says in the last days there shall come false Christ. Right. Not false Jesus now. Amen. False Christ, anointed ones. Amen. Falsely anointed to the Word. Denominational anointed, but not to the Word. Amen. For the Word will bear record of itself. Amen. It don't need nothing else. It'll bear record to itself. And there will come false anointed one. You got my tape on that. And that anoint. Oh, if you call them and say, Oh, you, are you a Jesus? Oh, certainly not. They wouldn't stand for that. But when it comes to an Oh, glory, I got the anointing, and it's a genuine anointing. Amen. Remember, KF has had it too and prophesied. Amen. So did Balaam have it and prophesied. But that don't have anything to do with this inside unless that was God seed his gene from the beginning, Amen. predestinated, right. you're finished. Amen. I don't care how much you shout, speak with tongues, run, shout. That Amen. has nothing to do with it. Amen. A cockleberry can count this as much as the interest of it. I've seen heathens raise and shout and speak in tongues and, and drink blood out of a human skull and call on the devil. <laughs> See, so you don't, any of them sensations and things, forget it. It's your heart and that word, and that's Christ. It's breathing there and watch it make itself known just as it opens up like any other seed and declares itself for the age it's living in. Amen. Luther could bring nothing but spring. These others could bring these other things. We're in a wheat age now. Luther's genuine. Luther's had to bring forth genuine Luther. Genuine Pentecost had to bring genuine Pentecost. It's all. But we're past that age and going on. You know the Catholic Church started out the Pentecostal? And if the Pentecostal Church is standing 2,000 years to be worse shape what... Catholic is now. Amen. So exactly. Amen. I say it to my brother, my sisters, who I love, and God knows that. But remember, friends, I got to be too young to the judgment. Right. And that will not be too long. I've got to bear a record of what's the truth. When I went forth into the meetings with you, praying for the sick, it was fine. But when I come with a message, if any message goes forth, if it's a true message, of, if it's a true, genuine miracles of God and hangs right in that organization, you know it's not of God. Because that thing's already declared. Jesus went forth and healed the sick in order to catch the eyes of people. Then his message. That's right. That's right. It has to have something that God's going to introduce to divine healing and miracles like that. Just catch the eyes of the people. The main heart of it is the message. Amen. That's what is what comes from in here. Amen. Trying to get the favor of the people so they'll sit and listen to him. See? For there's some in there that's ordained to life. Some of the rain of wheat fell on the ground and the birds picked it up and others fell amongst thorns and some of us went on prepared ground, pre-prepared ground and brought forth knots. The first thing is the sounding uh, the first thing is a trumpet, and, uh, or the voice, a shout, and then a voice, and then a trumpet. Shout a messenger getting the people ready. The second is the voice of the resurrection, the same voice, a uh, loud voice, in St. John eleven thirty eight and 44, that called Lazarus from the grave. Amen. Getting the bride together, and then the resurrection of the dead. See? To be caught up with it. Watch the three things take place. The next is what? was a trumpet, Amen. a voice, a shout, a voice, a trumpet. Now, the third thing is a trumpet, which always at the Feast of Trumpets is calling the people to the feast. And that'll be the bride's supper, the lamb's supper with the bride in the sky. Amen. See, the first thing that comes forth is his message, True. calling the bride together. The next thing is the resurrection of the sleeping bride, the, the one that died back in the other ages. They're caught together, and the trumpet, the feast. In the heavens, in the sky. Why, well, that's the thing that takes place. Man. We're right there, ready now. The only thing the church coming out has got to lay before the sun to ripen. The great combine will come by after a while. The wheat will be burned, the stalks, but the grain will be gathered into its garner. See, you're not blind people. You're, you're sensible people. And if I stood here and said those things for prejudice, I say it because it's life, because I'm responsible to God for saying it. And I must say it. And my message all the time, knowing back there, under healing and so forth like that, was just to catch the people's attention. Only the message would come. And here it is in them seven seals open those mysteries and showing those things is what's happened. I didn't know it. But... This man standing right here now was standing right with me. When you all heard me preach that sermon, sirs, what time is it? Amen. That morning, exactly where it said it would be, there stood seven angels standing right there from the heaven. And as they went up in that whirlwind, taking them up there, we stand and watch this went away. Science took the picture of it all the way across the nations down into Mexico. 
And there when I was watching one day when I started preaching these seven church ages, and I called Jack Moore, a great theologian. I said, Jack, who is this person standing there? There's one like the Son of Man standing there, hair as white as wool. I said, he was a young man. How could he have hair as white as wool? He said, Brother Man, that was his glorified body. That didn't ring the bell. But when I went in the room and started praying, he let me know what it was. See, I've always preached that he was deity, not just a man. Amen. He was God Amen. manifested in the flesh. Amen. God, the attribute of God, of love, the great attributes that come down displayed here on earth of God. Jesus was God's love, which built a body that Jehovah himself lived in. He was a fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. What God was, he manifested through that body. That body had to die so he could wash the bride with his, with his, uh, with his blood. And notice... Not only is the bride washed, forgiven, but she's justified. Amen. Did you ever try the word justified to see what it means? Now, for instance, if Brother Green heard that I'd been drinking and I'd been doing bad things, then he found out that I didn't do it. Then he comes and say, I forgive you, Brother Bram. You forgive me? I never done it. What are you forgiving me about? See? But if I'm guilty, then I can be forgiven, but I'm still not just because I did it. But the word justified is though you never done it at all. Amen. Justified. And then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us so from sin till it's put in the book of God's forgetfulness. He's the only one can do it. We can't we can forgive but not forget. Amen. I could forgive you, but I always remember you've done these evil things. Then you're not just, you're forgiven. But in the sight of God, the bride is justified. Amen. She never done it in the first place. Amen. Standing there married to the virtuous Son of God. Amen. Never sinned in the first place. Why? She was foreordained. She was Amen. tripped into this. Amen. And now when she heard the truth and come forth, the blood cleansed her. Amen. And she stands there virtuous. She has no sin on her at all. Therefore, the message calls the bride together. See, the shout and the trumpet, the same one with a loud voice, he screamed out with a shout uh, and, and voice and woke Lazarus. With a loud voice, he cried, Lazarus, come forth. Amen. See? And the voice wakes up, wakes up the sleeping bride, the sleeping dead. And the trumpet, with the sound of the trumpet, and when it does, it calls always a trumpet called Israel to the Feast of the Trumpets. Amen. See? Which was a Pentecostal feast, the great feast in the sky, and the Feast of the Trumpets. And now a trumpet denounced a calling together, calling to the feast, and now that is the, the uh, Lamb's Supper in the sky. Now watch. This assembling together and the bride, the Feast of the Trumpets, the Wedding Supper. We have seen it in types. Now watch just a moment before we close. Notice, we've seen it in types. Now, if you want to read in Matthew 18, 16, it said these three that bear record, see, and in in 1 John 5, 7, and so forth. Uh, three is always a witness. Is that right? It's a verification. Something that's right. Three witnesses bear the mouth of two or three witnesses let every word be established. Amen. Now notice we've had three witnesses. Three is a witness. Now we've already had three raptures in the Old Testament. Did you know that? As a witness. Now watch. Enoch was one. Elijah was the other. And Jesus was the other. Jesus being the keystone now. He bear record. See, he was a keystone between the Old and New Testament because he had to first die and then rapture. He died, come to life, and walked around here with us, and then was raptured up because he was the keystone that tied the two together. After his resurrection and rapture, look, after he did that and proved that the Old Testament there, we all know Enoch was translated. Amen. We know Elijah was taken up by whirlwind, right. that right in a chair to fire. And Jesus died, buried, rose up, and lived here on earth, and then was raptured up, Amen. the keystone. There's three to bear record. Is that right? Now, there has been one rapture already passed. You know that? Let's, let's see if we can't read it right quick. Let's get Matthew, the 27th chapter. And let's get the, about the 45th verse of the Matthew, the um, 27th chapter. Let's see if we can't get that right quick and see if, if we can't get just a little bit out of this would help us right quickly. 27 and 45, I believe I got wrote down here. Let's read. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Lamb, which is to say, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood by 
uh, heard it and said, This man calls Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. The rest said, Let us see where Elias will come and save him. Jesus, when he, he had cried with a loud voice, yielded up a uh, loud voice, loud voice, watch, when Jesus dying, screamed with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks did rent, and the graves were open, and many of the bodies of saints slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Amen. One rapture is past. Right. Three's happened in the Old Testament. Of them prepared who the word of the Lord came to. Amen. See? The word of the Lord came to Enoch. The word of the Lord came to Elijah's prophet. See? Right. The word of the Lord was Jesus. See? Watching the Old Testament, them Old Testament saints now, when this rapture first had taken place, notice verse 50, his loud voice awakened the Old Testament saints just exactly like the loud voice wakened Jesus, or wakened Lazarus. Amen. See? A loud voice awakened. And the second is fulfilled in Second Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Let's just take a read. read we just read it a few minutes ago. See, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those asleep, that you saw or not, even at First Thessalonians four twelve to eighteen. That that will be the second rapture. The second rapture will be the catching away of the bride. Amen. The Old Testament saints has gone into his presence, paradise done away, and. Uh, Old Testament saints to sit it up at his loud voice when he screamed to give up the ghost because why? The sacrifice, the propitiation of their sins that they'd waited on, believing that perfect lamb was coming, they'd offered the sacrifice to the lamb, and when he died and yielded up the ghost, he screamed with a loud voice, and the Old Testament saints awoke. Amen. Watch the shout and the voice over here, the same thing at his coming. See? Amen. Yielded up the ghost, and when he did, the sacrifice was perfect, and paradise emptied out. And the Old Testament saints came to the earth again, walked around on earth, and entered in with him at his rapture. David said, there, Lift up ye everlasting gates, and be ye lifted up. He led captive, captain, give gifts unto man. And the Old Testament saints went in with him. He said, Who is this king of righteousness, the Lord of glory, mighty and host? Mighty host. Here they come in marching. Jesus led captivity captive. Here he comes with the Old Testament saints and the winner of the new gates up there and said, Lift up ye everlasting gates and be ye lifted up and let the King of glory come in. Amen. The voice come from the inside said, Who is the King of glory? The Lord mighty in battle. Amen. The gates flew open and Jesus a conqueror led captive, captive. Them that bleed on him and the word had come to him. There are the Old Testament saints laying in there waiting. He led captive, captive. Amen. Amen. on high. Took the Old Testament saints and went in. There's one rapture already back. Amen. The next rapture takes place is Second Thessalonians for the church, the bride, to be resurrected, to be raptured into glory. We which are alive and remain, that's the bodies left on earth, will not prevent or hinder them which are asleep. For the trumpet of God shall sound first, and the dead in Christ shall rise. Amen. See? And we which are alive and remain shall caught up together with them. The other day I was standing on the street corner, and I, I was standing on, I was standing on the street corner, and watching the Armistice Day parade, and when it went up, going up the street, I stood there with my little son Joseph. There come the first was the old First War tanks come by, little old tanks. Actually, that come the great Sherman tanks of the New War, the great cannons with their muzzle blast, and, uh, a muzzle brake on them, so forth. After there come the soldiers, the, uh, the gold star mothers, and then there come a float with the on down. And we're out down there, come a float, and on the front of it was a grave to the unknown soldier. And there stood a, a soldier standing there, guard at the grave. There stood a Marine on the other side, and a sailor on the other side, and there's a petition drawn. And on the other side said a gold star mother, she'd lost her boy. There stood a young wife with her head open on the table crying. A little ragged boy sitting sideways and the tears running out of his face. He lost his daddy. I thought, what sadness. But I stand here and look. See them old, just a few of the soldiers left marching down there, crippled and old like that with their uniforms, but proudly displaying them because they were Americans. I thought, oh my God, one day there will come a blast from heaven and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
them Old Testament saints back under her awaiting a blast forth and come out of there first and go into the resurrection, we'll drop right in line going into the skies and these old mortal bodies changed and made like unto His own glorious body. What a, what a parade that'll be when it starts heavenward some of these days in that rapture time that lays ahead. Oh, proudly displaying the blood of Jesus Christ upon their chest. The message of God in the hour that they lived in. That's the hour that we're looking forward to, brother. Looking, just in closing now, the second resurrection, all, well, first one's past. The second one is at hand right now. We'll come to hand now. Now the third one is the two witnesses of Revelations 11, 11, and 12, which these are the ones that turns back with the Spirit of Christ to witness to the Jews like Joseph did to his brethren. And you remember their dead bodies laid in the street for three days and a half. And the spirit of life came into them, and they were raptured, taken up into heaven. There's your three raptures of the New Testament, three raptures of the Old Testament. All of them passed. Now we're ready, waiting for the raptures of, of the rapture of the saints. It's been spoken, and so shall it be. When God says anything, all heavens and earth will pass away, but that word will never fail. Amen. When God said back there in Genesis 1, He said, Let there be light. It might have been hundreds of years before there's any light. He said, Let there be a palm tree. Let there be an oak tree. Let there be a desert. Let there be a mountain. Let there be this. He spoke it. You see, and as long as it went out of His mouth in a word, it has to be manifested. Amen. It has to be. When Then one day He called His people out and He spoke to a man named Moses by a pillar of fire, a light, holy sacred fire and Moses put, the people wouldn't believe Moses so he said bring him out to this mountain that morning the mountain was all full of fire and flashing and thunders like that and the people said don't let God speak let Moses speak unless we perish God said I'll not speak to him no more like this but I'll raise him up a prophet and I'll speak to him and what he says will come to pass and you hear it because I am I am with him now, he spoke that. He said that it would come to pass. Look at this prophet Isaiah stand there. A man, intelligent man. A man was thought of well by the king because he lived with Uzziah, the king, which was a great man. Tried to take a preacher's place one time and went in, got smitten with leprosy. And that's what I told the businessman. Don't never try to take a preacher's place. No, sir. You stay right where you're at. See? You do your work what God told you. If you're a finger, you can never be an ear. If you're an ear, you'll never be a nose. Nose, eye. See? You stay in your position. You heard that message the other day on the broadcast trying to do God a service. David, anointed king, all the people shouting and screaming it was right, but he never consulted God's prophet, and a man died and the whole thing was marred. Amen. Don't try to do God a favor. You Amen. wait till it's God's term. Let it come in His way of doing it. I'll start this big thing and it'll do this. Be careful, brother. Now, David knew better than that. Nathan was in the land in that day. He wasn't even consulted at all. He consulted captains of hundreds and thousands. All the people shouted and screamed and danced and said they had all the religious motion. But it wasn't in the line and order of God's Word, and it failed. Anything else that's not in the line and order of God's Word will fail. Only God's Word will stand forever. Heavens and earth will pass away, but not my Word. Notice Isaiah, that intelligent young man, standing there. All at once the Spirit hit him. He couldn't say it. Over, and he was a prophet. He said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Unto us a son is born, a child is born, a son is given. His name shall be called Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. The end of his government shall be up on his shoulders, and the end of it, there shall be no end to his reign. How could that man intelligently say that a virgin would conceive? Everybody look for it. It's done been spoke. It was thus saith the Lord. It had to come to pass, because it was God's word, the same as it was in Genesis. Amen. When he planted them seeds down beneath the sea, where it was without form and void and water up on the deep. See, it had to come to pass. And one day, 800 years later, the womb of a virgin conceived the seed of God. A created seed. She brought forth the son. That same son stood there one day. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And a man had been dead four days. The rot in his nose fell in stump. He came forth. He said, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming. Amen. Amen. When all that's in the grave will hear the voice of the Son of God. So that... It's done, been spoken. It has to just going to be a rapture. Oh, my. I remember just my last message in California where I thought I'd never go back again. When I predicted Los Angeles will go beneath the ocean, thus saith the Lord, it will. Amen. She's done. She's washed. She's finished. What hour? I don't know when, but it will be sunk. Right after that, the earthquakes begin to joke and bow. Remember, many of you men stand right there. 
that rock that day when that angel came down there and that light and fire falling from the heaven around the rock where we're standing there. Amen. Rocks splaying out of the mountains and falling across the earth. She blasted three times hard. I said, judgment will strike the west coast. Two days after that, Alaska almost sunk. Amen. Remember that same God that said that, that Los Angeles is doomed. Amen. And she's finished. I don't know when. I can't tell you. I didn't know what said that. But this brother here, I believe it was, no, one of the Mosleys, I believe, had me out on the street out there. I didn't know what it was to look back. I looked back in the Scripture, and Jesus said, Capernaum, Capernaum, how uh, you have exalted yourself, brother. Uh, up into heaven shall be brought down into hell. For if the mighty works have been done in you, that have been done in Sodom, it stood today. And about 150 years from there, Sodom is already in the earth. Then Capernaum is in the water too today. And that same Spirit of God that said all these things and done all these things, it said there, O city Capernaum, who called yourself in the name of the angels, Los Angeles. How you've exalted yourself into heaven. The very root and seed of Satan. See? You've exalted yourself. Preachers, it's a graveyard for them. Good men go there and die like rats. What have you to call yourself in the name of the angels? If the mighty works have been done in Sodom, have been done in you, it's stood today, but your hour's come. You watch and see if it ain't I'm a false prophet. There she is, she's laying there. I remember that night before I seen that, I seen the preview of the bride. I stood there and seen a beautiful little lady just correctly dressed and then marching this way and there's somebody standing by me in the vision. And I seen, I said, the preview of the bride. I seen her go by. They come on this side and went around. And I heard it coming up the... The church is coming up from this other side. There come the Asian church. Oh, you talk about filth. Here come the European church. Oh, my. And then I heard a rock and roll coming. And it was Miss America, the church. And she didn't even have on any clothes. She had papers, like newspapers, gray, hold in front of her, dancing by rock and roll, Miss America, the church. I stood there in his presence. I thought, oh, God, as a minister, if that's the best we could do, oh, oh, you know how you feel. I thought, God, hi, if I could just get away from here. If all that we've done, and that's what we had to produce, if that's what, and then when them women passed by all doing all kinds of rocks and things and short hair and painted faces, and as they passed by like that, supposed to be virgins to Christ. And when she passed by like that, I turned my head, you know, with the, this whole in front of me is, is this graceful, the back of them. And there they was going like that, and I turned my head, weeping like that. I said, I, I couldn't stand it there. Him stand there and me know that me, a minister of the church, and that's what I'd produce for him. I said, oh God, I can't look at it. Let me die. Let me, let me fade away. And like that, and as soon as it went out, every time one of them would come, they'd go out to a certain place and drop off, and i just hear the sound of it as it went away. And then I heard something like onward Christian soldiers. And I looked, and here come that sainted bunch of little girls, just exactly Praise the way it was, all correctly dressed, their hair hanging way down in their back. So clean, marching like this to the step of the gospel. She was the word. It looked like one out of every nation. I was looking at it as it passed by. And seeing them pass by, instead of going down, they started going up. And I noticed one of them, trying, two or three of them, trying to get out of line. I screamed, stay in line! And the vision left me, and I was standing in this room screaming, stay in line! Line that wonder, could it be already passed? Could the bride already be called? Is that what we're going through today? She has to be molded and made into the image of Christ. And Christ is the Word. That's the only thing. See, it's in there, in the Word. It's just, see, there cannot be one thing added. It can't be a, a woman with a, one hand like a man and the other hand with a paw like a dog. It's got to be exactly the Amen. Word of the Lord, Amen. like He is the Word. The bride is a part of the bridegroom. The woman is a part of her husband because she's taken out of the husband. Eve was a part of Adam from his side. And so is a bride, not taken from a denomination, but taken from the bosom of the Word of God for this day. The rapture, the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise. And the glory of his resurrection share. When the chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the sky. When the rolls call upon her. Let's all try to be there, friends. God bless you. It's been spoken. It has to come to pass. It will come to pass. And little people, no one wants to die. No one wants to, to be lost. Let me tell you, whatever you do, I don't care how well you go to church and how loyal you are to church, that's fine. Nothing against that. You should go to church. You do that. 
keep on going to church, but whatever it is, throw away your traditions and move right on up into Christ. Because it's going to sound one of these days, and you're going to be caught with the mark of the beast on you and not know what it is until it's too late. That's exactly right. God bless you. I'm sorry to have kept you. And remember, I've kept them too long here. That's right. In the offering that you've taken for me, which I did not ask you to do that, brother. That's my that's courtesy. Take that and pay this motel uh, the overtime because I kept it. I just had a few things here. I got about eight or ten more pages on that rapture there, but I, I just didn't have time to give it. God bless you. Do you love the Lord Jesus? Amen. Let's just stand still just a minute now, quietly, reverently, and remember what I've said. Remember, we're in the last hours. These Nations are breaking. Israel's awakening. The signs that the Bible foretold. The Gentile days numbered with horrors encumbered. Return, O dispersed to your own. The day of redemption is near. Man's hearts are failing for fear. Be filled with the Spirit, your lamps trimmed and clear. Look up. Your redemption is near. You know that? False prophets are lying. God's truth they're denying. And we know that all is true, don't we? I love him. I love him. Be How many you really love him? Raise your hand. Uh, now, I want you, while we sing this again, shake hands to somebody near you. Say, God bless you, pilgrim. God, we are pilgrims, aren't we? Pilgrims and stranger. I love him. That's it, right across the table. I love him. the rapture? Amen. How many is interested in making the rapture? Say, God, I want to make it with all my heart. Hold to God's unchanging hand. You know the song? You know it, sister? Hold to God's unchanging hand. I don't know. What, what's it in, Pat? What? Hmm? Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Changing hand, build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. You like that? When our journey is completed. You have been true, fair and bright, your home in glory, your enraptured soul shall view, hold to God's unchanging hand, hold unchanging hand build your hopes on things eternal hold to God's unchanging hand I want you to bow your head just a moment now covet not this world's vain riches that so rapidly decay. See, T 
you've gained the heavenly treasure, they will never pass away. God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your or hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Oh, your head's bowed and this in mind knowing that we are bowing our heads to the dust from which we were brought, someday we'll return. Knowing that you've got a soul in there that has to answer to God. And if you feel that you're not just ready for that rapture, that if it would come tonight and you'd want to be remembered in prayer, just raise your hand. We have no place to make an altar call. Your altar's in your heart anyhow. Raise your hand. God bless you, you, you. My feel that I'm not ready, Brother Branham. I, I really, I, I, I want to be a Christian. I've tried to be. But there's always something missing. I, I know that I, I'm just not where I should be. Have mercy, God. I raise my hand. Be merciful to me. Now, some 20 or 30 hands has been up already in this little group. More is going up. Dear God, you know what's behind that hand down there out of the heart. I pray, dear God, there's only one thing I'm responsible for. That's to tell the truth. And dear God, they want to be saved. They want to really, they, they don't want this something, it's just some emotion, some workup, some uh, uh, denominational system, some creed, some dogma that's been added. They understand, Father, that it takes a pure, unadulterated Word of God. Everything else will pass away, even heavens and earth, but it won't. And if we be that Word, the earth will pass from beneath us, but we can never pass away because we are that word, the bride of the groom. I pray for each one that you will grant to them, Father, as my sincere prayer, and excuse me, Father, for being so nervous tonight, jumping up here late and, and being shaky and, and saying words broke up and cut up. Somehow another great Holy Spirit, splice them together in your own divine way and deliver them to the hearts of the people from my heart and the motive and the objective that in my heart I have towards you. Won't you, Lord, and save which can be saved. Draw to you, Lord, and may we be ready for that rapturing hour that's soon at hand. For I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you now, the chairman of the, of the convention.